Good evening. I'm Nina. And I'm Louise of Veruca Salt. And we would like to cordially invite you to an exhibition. Veruca Salt was one of the most prolific female-fronted alternative rock bands that emerged from the 90s. Their rise was rapid and overwhelming. After releasing two commercially successful albums, they shocked the public with the explosive breakup of their two front women, Nina Gordon and Louise Post. In this video, I want to talk about the rise, the breakup and the ultimate happy reunion of this iconic band, Veruca Salt. Nina and Louise both had unsteady upbringings. Nina had hippie parents, as she herself described them, who moved around a lot. Their relationship was shaking. Louise's parents were on rocky ground too for the most part of her childhood. They split up when she was 8 years old. But this is not the only thing that Nina and Louise had in common. Both of their childhoods were filled with music. Nina's mother sang and played the piano, and her father could play the guitar. Nina's older brother Jim, who ended up being a drama for Veruca Salt, also knew how to play the guitar. Music for Nina's family was the basic need for survival. It made life livable. However, music theory always scared Nina. When she was a kid, she tried learning how to play the guitar at a summer camp, but didn't do much to develop that skill further. She also took piano lessons, but again, it didn't go anywhere. Her ultimate dream was to become a singer in a band. She wanted other people to play the instruments so she can just write songs and sing. In high school, Nina did some classical music training and practiced singing. When she went to college, she thought she would major in music, yet she ended up majoring in art history and French literature. Supposedly, during her college years, Nina and her friends attempted to form a band. They came up with the name, found the right practice space, but ultimately never played a single show. Nina also tried learning to play electric guitar her brother had given her. He would teach her over the phone, and Nina would write down the positions of the fingers instead of the names of the chords. Being in a band seemed out of reach for Nina. She didn't believe it was possible. She took academics very seriously. Music was just an extra curriculum, until Nina met Louise, who enabled her dreams to come true. Louise's parents were both singers. They met in a summer choir, so music was a big part of their relationship. Louise has warm memories of singing at family gatherings together with her mom, who played the guitar. Her parents started taking her to musicals and opera from a young age, and Louise learned how to play the piano when she was little. During her school years, Louise did musical theater, started several bands with her friends and brother, and participated in talent shows. Despite having a passion for music, Louise decided to major in English literature in college, since she also loved reading and got into poetry during those years. Particularly in college, Louise began writing her own songs. A friend of hers gave her an acoustic guitar, but playing other people's material was a bit boring for Louise. She wanted to create music herself. It was a mutual friend who brought Louise and Nina together. After college, Nina worked at the Art Institute and was thinking of continuing her education in art history. Her music dream was still alive. She had an acoustic guitar and was writing songs, going to concerts, and wishing to sing harmonies together with someone else. Nina even put ads in the local newspaper looking for people to play music with. She met with a couple of dudes, but nobody in particular she connected with. The passion was there, but so was the fear. Nina knew she couldn't do it alone. She didn't know how to promote herself, and in her own in words, she wasn't the type of person who could just go out and busk in the street. Louise, on the contrary, knew that after college, she would either become a musician or be an actor. After graduating, she joined a theater company and got a job as a waitress. Still, the desire to run her own show prevailed. Louise's boyfriend at the time suggested that she wrote one song every day, so she did. She then had an opportunity to go to a studio where her brother was recording. He helped Louise record a few songs that she played at her New Year's Eve home party. Lily Taylor a well-known actress who was also an ex-girlfriend of Louise's boyfriend, attended the gathering, and when she heard these songs, she was very impressed. She couldn't believe it was Louise. She came directly over to me and said, is this you? I said, yeah. And she said, you have to meet my friend Nina. Louise and Nina hit it off instantly. They balanced each other out. Since for Louise, music was not just a hobby, she expected full commitment from Nina. She told her that she needed to start playing the guitar, and thus they began practicing three days a week. Louise really pushed Nina to perform in public and go to the studio. They started writing songs like crazy and playing at open mics. Their influences were very diverse, and when they first got together, they were playing folk songs. They were two women singing in harmony to acoustic guitars. After seeing such bands as The Breeders, My Bloody Valley, Valentine and L7, Nina and Louise made up their minds on what kind of band they wanted to be. It was 1992 and they considered themselves to be feminists, so initially they wanted to create an all-female band. 
they put an ad looking for two more girls, and they described their music as dreamy grunge. Despite meeting a couple of talented women, Nina and Louise couldn't find the right fit. And that is when they got a call from Steve Lack, their future bassist. Steve called and said, I really like your influences. Yeah. I'm not a girl. I'm not a girl. <laughs> Nina, Louise and Steve began practicing together, but they still needed a drummer. They actually had a good candidate, a girl, but she had to move, so it wasn't meant to be. And then Nina's brother Jim joined them. He didn't know how to play the drums, but he was willing to learn, since their energy and chemistry together as a whole band was perfect. Veruca Salt was named after the spoiled rich girl in the book Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Nina and Louise were not huge fans of the story or anything like that. They were in Nina's apartment, pulling out some books when they came across the cover for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and they just found the name to be cool. We're not really into Willy Wonka-ism. We just liked the name and we picked it. <laughs> We're not like part of some big fan club of Willy Wonka. <laughs> some cult of fans. <laughs> Nina explained later in one of the interviews that the name still reflected the attitude they had at the beginning. Beginning. Quote, well, we were young and not necessarily spoiled, but we had a very arrogant attitude of just, we want to dominate the world, we want it now. There was just a feeling of not necessarily a bratty little rich girl vibe, but more like, I want what I want and I don't want to apologize for it. So there was a whole kind of feminist attitude behind it. A feeling of, we can demand exactly what we want and get it. I think that was the inspiration. End quote. Louise wasn't wasting any time. She was booking the shows and sending Veruca Salt's four-song demo to different clubs. The buzz around the band grew, and after playing only a few live gigs, they were signed to a small label Minter Fresh Records and began recording with the producer Bradwood. The group's first single, See There, quickly took off and worked its way to major radio stations. <laughs> The full-length debut album American Thighs came out in 1994 while Veruca Salt was on tour with Hall. Soon almost every major label descended on the band and an intense label beating war ensued, resulting in Veruca Salt signing to Geffen Records. Their album was re-released, American Thighs was eventually certified gold and Sailor became an MTV hit. The name of the album was a nod to a famous ACDC lyric from the song You Shook Me All Night Long. There are many, I mean, I think many many, again, interpretations of what it could mean, and it means many things to us, um, having to do with women and their bodies and the, the way they're perceived and um, the way they're objectified, and that body part is particularly objectified. And the main single, See There, was written by Nina and is about suppressed female anger and rage that acts as an alter ego. I think it's fair to say that women tend to hold grudges and remain mad longer. You kind of let all these bitter feelings seethe inside you. And one of the definitions of the verb to seethe is to feel very angry, but to be unable or unwilling to express it clearly. Louise once said, quote, I like to say that it is whatever you want it to be. But we used to say that it was our internal vacuum cleaner. But it's basically just about the consummation of anger. The anger that surfaces and is relentless. You can't suppress it for very long. It will emerge. End quote. However, songs are more open to different interpretations, and there was a lot of speculation about what a Seether was. The song starts with the riddle, after all. So some people thought Seether was a pussy. You see a lot of them in the video, actually. The Seether is not a vagina. <laughs> but it was funny when people thought it was. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. The image of cats in the music video for Seether is very symbolic. A lot of times women are compared to cats specifically. Despite their elegant, soft, feline nature, they switch moods super quick. They growl and hiss and they scratch and bite. This juxtaposition is at the core of Veruca Salt's music in general. You have a contrast between angel-like soprano harmonies of Nina and Louise and heavy bass and drums. The energies and moods can switch inside one song, going from a lullaby to scream the lyrics can also get pretty dark and brutally sharp. But Seether is a relatively poppy song that still gets you going to the point when you want to smash everything around you. <laughs> 
Another single with a music video, All Hail Me, written by Louise, explores the celebration and the birth of a newly found identity. It's this belief that to become the best version of yourself, you must kill off the old you. Kind of like All Hail Me, the new me is reborn. At least that's how I always perceived it. That's also why in the music video, Veruca Salt is performing at a kid's birthday party. In the lyrics, the person apologizes to their parents for what they have become. Specifically, there is a line that says, They basically say, I'm not your little baby anymore, I'm all grown up now. You might not like this version of me, but this is who I am. In the music video that gives off this eerie vintage vibes, you see kids running around being kind of creepy, wearing masks and fighting for a toy gun. This can be tied to the whole loss of innocence thing. However, considering that the lyrics do reference plain murder of kids, some people believe All Hail Me talks about the glorification of violence and serial killers, which is an interesting take too. The next single, number one blind, is the reflection of the album cover on which you can see a worn down sleeping gown. This gown is also shown in the music video. The song encapsulates this very specific feeling of a lazy, depressing Sunday afternoon. Nina was the one who wrote it and she basically dedicated this song to a company that manufactures blinds and shades named Levelor. Veruca Salt uses personification in their lyrics quite often. They like taking inanimate objects and referring to them as if they were human, like if it was the name of a person. The same thing happens with the single Victrola, written by Louise, a song about an old record player that she loved. The music video for Number One Blind is so, so dreamy and cozy. It portrays a rainy autumn day when you want to stay inside in your pajamas with a mug of hot chocolate. American Thighs is in general like this. American Thighs is like um, just something soft that it, or, or like a thermal underwear shirt that had been, that had been washed a million times. It's really soft and comfortable that you just throw on and but it, eventually it feels very natural to you. It eventually gets so holy and dissolves from all but the one day, But one day you look in the mirror and you go, what the hell am I wearing? <laughs> There's one more sleepy track written by Nina that actually perfectly concludes the album called Sleeping Where I Want. It again explores this drowsy, fuzzy state, but when it comes to relationship, you hope to be with a person until they quote unquote burst your tiny bubble, as Nina sings. <laughs> Many songs on this album mirror each other like this. They go in pairs. For instance, Celebrate You and For Cynthia are about Nina and Louise's childhood memories. Little anecdotes about those times. This is what Louise said about Celebrate You. Quote, it started with my father and extended to the other men in my life. I spent so much time celebrating them that I sort of neglected to celebrate myself or even acknowledge myself in that way. End quote. For Cynthia, named after Brad Yellow Flower, is Nina's song and it's about lying as a kid in order to feel accepted by others. Another pair of tracks, which are very similar in their mood and content, is Fly and Twin Star. They are slower, more somber songs about being tired and feeling hopeless. And Twin Star, Nina directly says, Darker themes I also delved into in the song Wolf, that Louise is very proud of. She wrote it in one session. Quote, that song just poured out of me so naturally, the memory of it is particularly powerful because I was writing about someone I had lost and was still grieving. That song carries so much personal weight. I'm not sure if it's the best song I've ever written. In fact, structurally and vocally and melodically, there may be better songs that I've written, but that one is the most meaningful. End quote. Summer was The last song from this album that I want to mention is Spider-Man 79. This is a relationship song where the narrator's partner is compared to a spider that slowly entraps their prey. Louise once shared the story behind it. Quote, 
Spider-Man was about this guy I dated in Chicago. He was from the south side and he wasn't smart enough for me. But I felt for him anyway and then the relationship ended and I remember thinking like, why does this matter at all? How did I start to care about this person? He's not good enough for me in any respect. How did I get so tangled with this guy? So those lyrics like, he came up from the south with oil on his hands, was like him working on his car and reds pulled from a can is him smoking his Marlboro reds and it was all in the relation to that guy and his name was Kevin, end quote. As I've said, American Thighs was a successful album. It got many positive reviews. Still, it didn't shield the band from backlash. People were saying that there were sellouts, they weren't indie enough, they were just angry feminists, or they were not feminist enough because they applied lipstick on stage. Basically, we were accused of having been a man, ma, uh, an, um, the result of a manufacturing marketing meeting and that you know we had been a fabricated concept. And that was really insulting. The answer to this criticism was an EP titled Blow It Out Your Ass, It's Veruca Salt, with a cover art of the whole band dressed in toilet paper and a sarcastically manic riot girl song called Shimmer Like a Girl. <laughs> In 1997, Veruca Salt came back with the second full-length album Eight Arms to Hold You, with a golden octopus on the cover. The title is a reference to the working title for the Beatles film Help. Nina's brother Jim left the band soon after the release of Eight Arms. He was replaced by Stacy Jones of Letters to Cleo. Nina said, quote, Jim was the moral glue in the band. His leaving was big, end quote. This is basically when everything started to go downhill behind the scenes, resulting in Nina leaving the band in early 1998. Eight Arms was produced by Bob Rock, well known for his work with Metallica. And you can hear those Metallica vibes right away in the first track called Straight. Stay straight! As a whole, this album moved towards hard rock and heavier grunge. The single Volcano Girls written by Nina became the successor of Seether. Nina even references this song in the lyrics. I told you about the Seether before. You know the one that's neither or nor. Well, here's another clue if you please, the Seether's Louise. Nina explained, quote, See, there was a song about being a girl and being told by society that expressing anger outwardly is unacceptable. It was about trying to beat down my own temper to no avail. Then Volcano Girls was written about me and Louise being on the road non-stop and trying to be Wonder Women of Rock and be tired and just wanted to give up and stay in bed. The Cedars Louise bit was really just me having a laugh and referencing the Beatles song Glass Onion. I had always wanted to do that and in the middle of writing Volcano Girls, I realized that this was my chance." End quote. The music video begins with Nina singing as she is lying under bed sheets. This is such a throwback to American Thighs with its lazy, sleepy, cozy bedroom vibes. And the opening lyrics are very relatable. The setting then changes and you see the band perform in the arena with bungee cords attached to them. Surrounding this arena stand a group of fans who cheer for them. Pretty minimalistic video. Nancy Bartowell was the main person who directed the music videos for this album and it was her idea to incorporate bungee cords. There isn't much information about Nancy, but she started her career as a painter and eventually became more well known in the rock music video world. She directed Hall's clip Celebrity Skin. Nancy likes to deconstruct femininity and you don't really see it with Volcano Girls, but it's very apparent in the music video for another single, Shutterbug, that was written by Louise, who described it like this. Quote, Shutterbug is sort of a photo album of my life, of the band's life, of making our own decisions and choices and being really psyched about them. End quote. Shutterbug is definitely a song about self-empowerment. This message is in the chorus as Nina and Louise sing. <laughs> In the clip, Veruca Salt performs in what seems like a Baroque-style ballroom with Nina and Louise wearing very gorgeous vintage-looking corset dresses. Throughout the video, they change outfits a couple of times, slipping into white bras and extravagantly long hoop skirts, with a huge metal spring under it that helps them swing their bodies back and forth to the flow of the song and scream the lyrics right into the viewer's face. And of course, you can't forget their bicycle dresses. Such glam was a big change for the band that used to wear and perform in t-shirts and jeans. As Louise said, they had to live up to a new bigger sound of this album. The music video 100% elevated the whole song. My husband says, so when was it that you guys switched? It's like you were dressed like, you know, just jeans and t-shirts and boots, kind of like, you know, like teenagers or, you know, people in their 20s. And all of a sudden you grew up. It might have been on a Tuesday. 
<laughs> you started dressing up. Another track about self-celebration and refusal to let criticism get to you is awesome, written by Nina. Do you think we're stuck up? I worried a little bit <laughs> in one song. I worried a little bit. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. I love this song. There is something about the way she emphasizes and rolls the word awesome in the chorus. It pierces your ears in a good way. Nina's so awesome. adorable squeaks can also be heard on a track called With David Bowie. It's a playfully innocent song about Nina's little childhood crush on David Bowie. I just walked to school thinking about, you know, fantasizing about being with David Bowie or being a rock star myself like David Bowie and that kind of confusion like do I want to just be with him or do I want to be him? Compared to American Thighs, Eight Arms is certainly a more hopeful and high-spirited album, both in terms of sound and lyrics. There are quite many songs about romantic relationships and dating. The darkest topic Nina and Louise touch upon on the album is drugs. Tracks like Straight and Stoneface are pretty much about the same thing. A boyfriend who is so deep into his addiction, he doesn't pay attention to his girlfriend anymore. Stoneface literally starts with the lines. Don't Make Me Prove It and Loneliness Is Worse are songs about the dissatisfaction with the current relationship. The message is actions speak louder than words. The narrator is tired of empty promises. I really enjoy Louise's raspy screams on this album. There's so much pain in her voice when she sings about a destructive but intoxicating relationship in one last time. When despite understanding that someone is not right for you, you still want to get back with them and give your relationship a second chance. One of my favorite singles from this album after Shutterbug, respectfully, is Benjamin. If you listen to it, read the lyrics, it seems like this song is about a lost love. Benjamin, no, did you but nothing is too simple with Veruca Salt. I've read that before performing Benjamin, sometimes Nina would say that this is a song about forbidden love between a very young girl and a much older rabbit. So people believe that this track is about Nina's rabbit that ran away. Looks like this animal is pretty significant for Veruca Salt. It first appears on the cover for a single number one blind. The rabbits are seen in the music video too. And the cover art for Benjamin also has a white bunny. However, in more recent interviews, Nina explained that she was inspired by a scene from the movie The Graduate. Benjamin uh, was inspired by the movie The Graduate. There's that crazy scene where um, Dustin Hoffman is about to go tell Catherine Ross that he's been having an affair with her mother. And it's shot in this crazy way where she's just like, I'm just, and Anne Bancroft is such an incredible actress, and she's just saying, Benjamin, no, no, Benjamin. And there was just something about it, and I was like, Benjamin, no. Honestly, who was it about? I don't know. Eight Arms concludes with the track Earth Crosser, which exemplifies what it's like to be on tour and perform live in front of people. It starts out quiet, almost in a whisper, and then it fully erupts. The best part happens just before the final chorus. The song is nearly silent, and then Nina and Louise smack you in the face with the most hilarious line that won't let you forget the song. It's quiet again. In 1998, during the making of the third album, Nina suddenly quit Veruca Salt to pursue a solo career. There were a lot of factors that contributed to the breakup. Some of them were related to the business side of keeping a band going, and others to more personal internal issues. The second record failed to meet the set expectations, and since Veruca Salt wasn't a massive band, when shit hit the fan, everyone kind of let it fall apart. Had we sold 11 million records, we may have stayed together because our management probably wouldn't have let us break up. Yeah. No. Our record label wouldn't have let us break up. <laughs> you know, if you are that, then everybody fights to keep you together. The band didn't have a leader. Both Nina and Louise were considered to be the front women of the group. And at first, the competition between them was healthy, until it wasn't anymore. Of course, everyone wanted to know the exact reason that led to the downfall of everything. But at the time, Nina and Louise really couldn't admit, even to themselves, how much pain that split caused. 
Only after more than a decade later, Nina would comment, it was drugs and cheating and all that junk, and the two of us not talking about what was really going on. And then in another interview, we were having sort of like cliched cat fights over some dude, you know? It was so dumb now in retrospect. Like really? Seriously? But at the same time, we had to go through what we went through. Stacy Jones, the drummer, left the band at the same time, and he and Nina dated for some time. Steve also left. After the split, Nina and Louise buried themselves in work, trying to sort out their anger and hurt through music. Nina on her first solo album, Tonight and the Rest of My Life, and Louise on the next Veruca Salt's album, Resolver. Louise couldn't accept the failure of the band, so she kept the name, recruited new members, and signed with a new label, Beyond Records. Despite not communicating with each other, Nina and Louise were producing albums almost in sync. They were also both trying to process not only the breakup of their friendship, but their personal romantic breakups as well. Compared to Nina, at one point, point, Louise's dating life became more public. She got into a relationship with Dave Kroll. Sadly, during Veruca Salt's 1997 tour, right before Nina's departure, Louise found out about his infidelity, got drunk, and proclaimed on stage that Kroll had cheated on her with Winona Ryder. So all of those emotions got poured into Resolver, the title of which is a play on the Beatles album Revolver. Louise commented, quote, I still want to be hurt so badly. I'm really ranting and screaming on this album and practically weeping on a lot of it because the stakes are so high for me. This record had to come straight from my heart. It had to be the most open, vulnerable expression of music that I've ever made." End quote. Resolver is probably Veruca Salt's best record in terms of album sequencing and sound consistency. This is the only album I love listening from start to finish. Resolver starts with a small soft intro in which Louise murmurs that she's not the same person as she was before. And immediately after it, the guitar roar of Born Entertainer brings you out of the cradle. This single is believed to be about Nina thanks to the very straightforward first verse. the music video which is a bit cheesy. Louise with her new band members is performing inside a wooden coffin underground. Then for people wearing black cloaks come to the cemetery to dig up Virgasol's grave. And there's a little plot twist at the very end. All four people happen to be Louise. The message is pretty clear. You thought I would disappear, you thought this was the end, but here I am, I revived the band. There's still a very sweet part in the middle of the song which hints at the fact that Louise still misses Nina. Or this might be about her ex-lover, who knows, but Louise sings, I want you to want me, I need you to need me, I dare you to ditch me, I beg you to miss me. And this is a reference to the song I want you to want me that was originally written by the American rock band Chip Trick. But I think a lot of people know the cover of it by Letters to Clear for the movie 10 Things I Hate About You. Another track on Resolver that became symbolic of Nina and Louise's split is Used to Know Her. Louise actually started writing this song in 1997 about her stepmom, and Nina even helped her with it. But eventually it turned into the best I'm so angry I want to yell song. It's divided into two parts. The first part is dedicated to Nina, and the second to Louise's ex-boyfriend. <laughs> In 2022, Louise shared previously unreleased demos, a six-song collection titled But I Love You Without Mascara, and it included Used to Know Her demo along with a homemade style video for it. This was Louise's way of looking back at herself, a girl she used to be and used to know and closing the chapter of her life. The last track on this album that mentions Nina and that could be about her is Only You Know, which is a lot of people's favorite song. <laughs> Some tracks on Resolver sound very eerie and sinister because they start in a hushed tone. Officially Dead is one of these songs and it's the ultimate angry breakup anthem, which is very satisfying to listen to when you're mad at everyone, doesn't even matter whom exactly. <laughs> This album is a good balance between abrasive and sweet. It's not all about aggression and attitude. Louise shows her vulnerability on many tracks, and the ones that stand out the most are disconnected and all dressed up. They are very gut-wrenching. In Disconnected, the narrator is looking back at a dark period in her life, at a very painful breakup and how it affected her. But she's ready to move on, she even met someone better. It has comforting lyrics like, I'm in love with the future and I'll touch the sky. All dressed up in contrast leaves you feeling like such a mess. This song asks one question. Why am I not enough? 
I'm willing to change the aspects of my identity that you don't like and still you can't love me. I'm here in front of you all dressed up. It's the sad realization that no matter how good and perfect you are, you can't force another person to love you. Nia's solo album that she recorded with Bob Rock was much more pop than the rock Viruk Assault was known for. And if you compare the two, they're night and day in terms of the sound. I'm as light as The first single titled Tonight and the Rest of My Life did well and was even included in a commercial for The Notebook, in addition to an appearance on an episode of Charmed. Nina commented on this genre switch in one of the interviews, quote, I think everyone had always sort of pegged me as the pop chick and Louise as the rock chick, and we both sort of crossed over into each other's so-called territory. When I say pop, I mean good, strong songs with good, strong melodies. Virka Salt sort of got out of control and they kept going in a kind of metal direction, which it was fun. It was fun to wear like the leather jumpsuits we wore on the second tour, but it didn't feel completely… you know what? It did. It did feel completely right at the time. At the time, it felt awesome. It felt totally badass cool. But I grew up a little bit and I think I'm more interested in, I don't know, being myself." End quote. In terms of the lyrics and the overall mood of the record, it's a similar balance between darkness and light, the past and the future. Nina sings about her regrets and concerns, the breakup with her boyfriend, falling in love again, excitement for the future, and of course Louise. Nina was way softer with her words though. There are three tracks that point to Louise, the first being Number One Camera, which is a very playful track with clapping. Nina sings, I should probably sort of miss you, but I see you all the time in Polaroid. One of my favorite songs on the album is Hate Your Way. It's super catchy and reminds me of old work assault. I always felt like it was about Louise based on these lines in the chorus. Had to sell my soul, but you were so rock and roll. Nina was asked about this song in an interview and she said this, quote, it's more just about sort of despising somebody and yet being attracted to them at the same time. When you are attracted to some guy because he's an asshole, you know what I mean? End quote. The last song I want to mention is Black and Blonde, pretty telling title. I just like a distorted guitar paired with an interesting lyrical structure. Black and Blonde is a very wistful track for me. Nina goes through a roller coaster of emotions. At the beginning, she's confused. She asks, What's that sound? Somebody tell me what the hell is going on. Then she gets a bit angrier, constructing the narrative around this middle child, aka Louise. But it's not a mean song. You can hear frustration in Nina's voice, and at the beginning, she seems sarcastic as she sings, Save the middle child child, she's never what she seems. Can't blame the middle child, she's drowning in her dreams. Nonetheless, towards the end of the track, Nina repeats the same lines, but with pity and sadness in her voice. At the end, Nina cites Earth Crosser from Veruca Salt's previous album. Now those lines sound pensive. Nina confessed that it was one of her most scathing songs about Louise. Surprisingly, Louise told her that she loved it and Nina too admitted that Louise's meanest songs about her are in her favorites. Quote, it was definitely painful to hear songs about me that were not very kind. And it was painful for her. That was our version of having the fist fight that we never had, that we should have had. She would throw a punch through her music and I would throw a punch. So there was something cathartic about writing those songs. And there was something cathartic about hearing hers. End quote. After tonight, Nina began writing material for her second solo album that was set to see the light of day in 2004, under the name Even the Sunbeams. Yet, only a few months after completing the record, Nina admitted that she was unhappy with it and that she wasn't going to release it. It was no fault of the producer. It was it, Everything sounds really good and it's, it's a really nice album. It was just really slow and really sad. Together with Bob Rock again, Nina decided to redo the old material and record new songs as well. The result was Bleeding Heart Graffiti, the album that was released in 2006. Nina was pregnant with her daughter, so she didn't do any promotion for it. Naturally, Nina's music career faded to the background and she dedicated herself to being a mom. Louise went through similar things. Unfortunately, Resolver didn't enjoy the same success as Veruca Salt's previous albums. Veruca Salt's lineup was always changing. In 2003, the officially dead EP was released and it charted well in Australia, so the band focused their touring activities there. Veruca Salt then recorded another five-song EP, Lords of Sounds and Lesser Things, that came out in 2005. And finally, before going on an indefinite hiatus, Veruca Salt released a full-length album 4 that wasn't commercially successful. Like Resolver before it, this 
album was released a month apart from Nina's solo album. And like Nina, Louise ultimately decided to step away from music and focus on her family. Motherhood was ultimately what brought Nina and Louise back together. They actually started emailing each other here and there since 2003. By 2008, they both had married and started families, so they began confiding in each other more, but only via email. Louise was going through a really rough patch. She had a miscarriage and right after that, her husband had a series of emergency surgeries. And that's when Nina became a big support system for Louise. It was such an incredible gift to me. Mm -hmm. But she understood. And she proceeded to be, from that moment on, what she called my pregnancy sponsor. And was there for me around every juncture, and around every corner. And I went on to have two more miscarriages, and then I had my daughter. Oh, okay. And Nina was there for me throughout all of it. Nina explained, quote, We had such a traumatic breakup, Louise and I. In a way, it was more traumatic than breaking up with a boyfriend. I'd never had a close girlfriend that I had a complete rift with. We blocked each other out of our lives for at least 10 years. We didn't speak for at least five. We didn't see each other for 14, and it broke our hearts, end quote. Nina and Louise finally met in 2012. Messi Star had reunited and were performing together for the first time in 15 years at Coachella. And when Nina heard about this, she realized that they had to bring Veruca Salt back. Quote, it gave me this pang of wanting to sing with Louise again, like really wanting to. I emailed her and said, hey, Maisie Star are playing Coachella, shouldn't we? And she said, maybe we should start with coffee, end quote. When the two got together for dinner, they cried and went through the whole range of emotions from regret to relief. They couldn't understand why they let things happen and why it took them so long to repair such a precious connection they once shared. Nina and Louise reconnected with Steve and Jim and all four of them were ready to pick up where they left off. This time, however, the songwriting process was very, very different. Having more wisdom and experience, having children, being married allowed them to collaborate and help each other more. Compared to the 20s when individuality was so crucial and any type of feedback could be viewed as a personal attack. Women in their 20s, no offense to women in their 20s, but like some crazy shit happens. You know, we were so like the stakes seemed so crazy high in everything we said and did. And now it's sort of like we're just more grounded. Ghost Notes, the first album to feature the band's original lineup since 1997, was released in 2015. And I have to say, when you listen to it, it feels like Veruca Salt never had that fight and they never left. You recognize their sound right away. It also might be because not every song on this album is new material, so Ghost Notes is basically a time capsule. Nina said, quote, I think a lot of the content in the new songs is about our feelings surrounding the breakup, regrets about the breakup, the thrill of getting back together. It's really not so much about our individual lives the way it used to be." End quote. It's very interesting that before, with the first two albums, there was a clear distinction between who wrote which song. But with Ghost Notes, it just says, written by Veruca Salt. Nina and Louise also shared that all the gory details people wanted to know about their breakup are in the lyrics, and anybody can figure out exactly what happened. So let's dive in. The opening track, The Gospel According to Saint Me, is just full of celebration and liberation. I've mentioned that listening to this album feels like opening a time capsule, and this is exactly what you hear in the lyrics. They even give their listener a warning that Viruka Salt are here to rock. Nina and Louise decided to deconstruct and reclaim the song Black and Blonde, make it about their breakup and include it as the second track. The sweetest part of this song is the apology to that middle child Nina initially wrote about. Sleep little child, I forgive you, and for the tears I caused, I'm sorry too. Undoubtedly, one of the most bittersweet songs on this record is Eyes on You, that is, in Nina's words, a forensic study and autopsy of her and Louise's relationship. That's why in the music video the band members are studying each other through a TV. And at one point, Louise is reading a book called Nina. They rewind the history to pinpoint where it went wrong, and every time Nina and Louise say, wait, don't grow up yet, it pulls at my heartstrings. <laughs> Wait, don't grow up yet, cause it's free. 
Prince of Wales was apparently inspired by that incident that happened with Louise in 1997 when she got drunk and spilled the beans about Dave Grohl on stage. Louise said, quote, I got very familiar with the toilet backstage at the Prince of Wales. I hold the record for inebriation in my life from that show. End quote. The song is built on repetitions. I remember that girl refrain makes it sound haunting and at the same time reassuring. I remember that girl, my past self. I will always remember her, but I'm not that girl anymore. I'm moving on. Tracks like The Sound of Living, Lost to Me and Triage appear to be about Nina's departure from the band. Nina wrote Triage right after leaving and it's a confessional song where she explains her side of the story and how dead inside she felt. It's a throwback to the well-known Veruca Salt with their love for quiet, whisper-like intros and harsh, crunchy guitars in the chorus. It goes from soft to loud and back over and over. We're all My number one song on this album is Empty Bottle, where singers reminisce about what it was like being in a band in Chicago in the 90s. To me, this song is emblematic of friendship, especially when I hear the lines, I don't want to drown if you're not drowning with me, and I don't want to bleed if you're not bleeding with me. Nina's piercing vocals make them so painfully touching. Dark Thing and I'm Telling You Now seem to be about retrospecting and reconciling. Nina and Luis sing, I'm saying it loud and clear, I'm still here. In Laughing in the Sugar Bowl, Nina and Luis celebrate their restored friendship. The music video slowly shows the rebuilding of burned bridges, so to speak. Nina and Louise are wearing t-shirts that say poet and liar and they keep switching between them probably implying that they're both at fault. It reminds me of the lines from the track Triage, but we're all offenders, we all lie. She's the flame and I'm the glow. Look who's laughing in the sugar bowl. The Museum of Broken Relationships, named after a real museum which first appeared in Croatia, is Veruca Salt's way of closing that chapter of their life. The sole purpose of the real museum is to treasure and share people's heartbreak stories and symbolic possessions. Put the relics of your lost love on display and lock the door. And the final track that closes out the album is Alternica, which embodies nostalgia. Nina and Louise look back on the alternative music scene that gave rise to their band. No matter what happens, things tend to always work out in the end. They triumphed over all their hardships, and to the bells and symphonic horns, they are moving to the next stage of their lives. Many people when talking about Veruca Salt express sadness that Nina and Louise basically ruined the band over some petty reasons involving some guy. And that this is such a negative stereotype about women. Because obviously women never feel jealous and they never compete and they're very direct. Some people really can't accept that sometimes stereotypes are not really stereotypes. Even Nina and Louise, while giving interviews, expressed so much regret that their whole idea of creating an all-female band and showing the girls that they can be successful together and they can do business together flopped in a way. I honestly believe that Nina and Louise did way more by showing their uncensored lives and what can happen between girls and young women. These are not just some sexist negative stereotypes. This is reality for many people, including myself. By giving their example, Nina and Louise actually tell people that their feelings are valid, but don't wait 15 freaking years to reconnect with a friend you had a falling out with but can't stop thinking about. Understand your emotions, put your pride aside, own your shit, and apologize no matter who you think was wrong. And restore that magic chemistry and connection you once had with that person if you truly want to and think it's worth it. In 2015 interview, Nina stated, It's such a nice lesson to learn that life is long and a friendship can be damaged, but it's not irreparable. Sometimes you just need time.